being recorded, please keep your cameras off. We also ask that you meet yourselves at this time. My name is Jasmine Shoemaker and I, along with my colleagues, Emily Cullen, Susan Graham, and Semhar Johannes, are on the Spotlight Guest Instructor Workshop Series. In this series, we invite university community members and friends to share their research and creative endeavors in one hour talks hosted in the library or virtually. Due to the ongoing success of the Spotlight Series, we have expanded the parameters to create a semester long theme symposium every fall semester. This semester long symposium titled Prison State aims to explore the regional and pervasive impact of prison incarceration in Maryland and the current debate around prison abolition. The inspiration for the theme comes from the library special collections prison related materials. Today, we welcome our final speaker of the symposium, Nate Bayless. Nate is the director of the Juvenile Justice Strategy Group at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. He leads the JDAI network of juvenile justice practitioners in 40 states and over 300 counties that is working to build a better and more equitable youth justice system. Through his leadership, the foundation has launched several youth justice projects and initiatives, including transforming juvenile probation, ending the youth prison model, and JDAI Connect an online community that accelerates youth justice reform across and beyond the JDAI network through peer-to-peer -peer learning, training, and resources. Maryland's governor appointed Nate to the state's Juvenile Justice Reform Council for a two-year term in 2019. Prior to this time at Casey, he was the research manager for the Washington, D.C.'s Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services. A native of Maryland, Nate earned a master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University and a bachelor's degree from Franklin and Marshall College. His presentation today is titled A New Normal or Old Status Quo, Youth Justice in a Post-Pandemic World. And with that, I'll turn it over to our speaker. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks for everyone from coming here today and thanks everybody who's online. Uh, I'm going to try to adjust to the camera and not get not get too close. Uh, it's kind of an up and close and personal look. Um, but uh, I just want to say it's a real it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, with all of you. I've lived here in Catonsville for the last 15 years and having UMBC in our backyard has been one of the best things about living here in Catonsville uh, and raising a family here. Um, it's, it's an honor to speak at such a prestigious university and I'm really glad that you're here to join me in this room and, um, and online. So before I get into the thick of my presentation today, I wanted to start with a modified activity. It's something that one of my colleagues does often with juvenile probation professionals when he's talking to them about the need for probation transformation, which is one of the topics we'll talk about today. So I'm going to start with this real quick. Um, sorry, I'm trying to change the slides here. Didn't want to advance. We'll hit this button. There it is. Okay. Um, all right. So Take a look at this and take 30 seconds. Don't even think about it. You might have even seen this before. And I want you to think about uh, a child that you know. Maybe it's your niece, maybe it's your nephew, maybe it's your sibling, all right? Someone that you love in your life. Or maybe if that's too hard to do because you're in college and you don't know that many kids at that age, think about your own parents and if they were writing this letter to you as a young child. And I want you to just whether you're writing it down or in your head, just fill in the blanks. I'm going to give you 30 seconds and then we're going to jump into this. All right, I didn't even give you 30 seconds. So, so what did, so what did you write? You know, I hope that you grow up to be throw, throw something out. At me. Something great, happy, a decent human. What else? You 
You want to experience what? What would I want you to experience? Joy. Joy, life. Okay, you, you get the point. So how many of you, all right, just raise your hand, if you wrote, you hope that they'll learn to follow the rules? How many of you wrote that? <laughs> how about have positive peers? Did any of you say have positive peers? Okay, we got one for positive peers. How about go to school every day? What about refrain from using drugs? How about not get arrested? <laughs> Make curfew. Okay, so, you know, just by virtue of being in the room today, I would guess for the most part, those responses are not what you would typically want. When you're thinking about someone you love, someone you care about, you're imagining really great things for their future. And yet when we subject young people to the juvenile justice system, we expect a whole lot of compliance with rules, um, and we offer very little opportunity for growth and for achievement. Um, all of that good stuff that we want for people that we care about, all that stuff goes out the window, all right? And my hope uh, is that we want a brighter future for all young people. And when we say that in, our, in my organization, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, that's what we stand for. But when we say that, if we want it for all young people, we especially need to want it for young people who come in contact with our juvenile justice system. So the title of, of my talk today, uh, a new normal or old status quo, it refers to a lot of things about youth justice today. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it means a, a lot of things for me. It's a lot of choices, right? It's community versus incarceration. It's relationships versus surveillance. It's sanctions and incentives. It's, it's, it's opportunities versus compliance. It's all of those things. And I'd like to offer that all of these things are choices. They're real choices. And what you'll hear a lot from me today is that while the discussion in the media or among politicians when it comes to crime and young people is about what we can do to change their behavior, the young people's behavior, um, you know, kids these days, right? We hear that in every generation. Um, the real question is whether we can change the behavior of adults who make decisions about kids every day, especially in these juvenile justice systems. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. Now, real quick, before I jump into that, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Annie Casey Foundation, mainly because I think it sets up the rest of what I wanna talk about. Um, the Casey Foundation, which is located right here in Baltimore, not very far from here, is the largest foundation in the country, the largest philanthropy in the country focused specifically on improving the lives of children and families. Um, the foundation was founded by Jim Casey, whose picture you can see here. Uh, Jim Casey started a messenger service as a teenager in Seattle, where he grew up in the early 20th century uh, to support his mother and siblings. A decade later, they expanded beyond Seattle, changed their name to United Parcel Service or UPS, as we all know it, um, Jim named the Annie Casey Foundation after his mother, Annie, back in 1948, with a focus on helping disadvantaged kids. That was the, that was the purpose. Now, the vision of the foundation, as I said before, is that all children in the United States have a brighter future. It is precisely because of that vision uh, that the foundation has spent the last 30 years investing in juvenile justice reform, and more specifically, investing in efforts that have been aimed at safely reducing our country's reliance on confinement for, for as a response to adolescent misbehavior. Because quite frankly, uh, the antonym to brighter future is warehousing young people in detention centers and youth corrections facilities. Now, I've been at the Casey Foundation for the last 15 years, and, and, as, and as my intro said, I worked in the juvenile justice system in Washington, D.C. before that. Um, where I was the research manager. So I tend to start with data and go out from data, right? So, so that's gonna happen today. So if you don't like data, I'm gonna apologize, but I'm gonna try to make it entertaining and interesting, but I'm gonna talk a lot about data as part of this. Um, and I promise not to dwell too long on the data points. Um, I know some of you may have taken classes in juvenile justice, but I figured that at least a really short, albeit terribly incomplete history of juvenile justice would be helpful because even if you've learned about broader criminal justice issues, juvenile justice is sort of its own thing. Um, so I'm gonna try to do this super fast and rather than offer a, like a comprehensive timeline, I'm gonna hit some what I think are important themes and events 
that I, I think are especially important to understanding what's still happening today. Um, so believe it or not, much of what we do in juvenile justice today is driven by practices seen as reforms at the time from the 19th century, right? The 1800s. Um, until the mid 19th century, youth and children were routinely housed in adult jails and prisons. Um, and actually, I might as well stop for a second because I think today I'm going to talk about detention and I'm talk about incarceration. And, and, and it's important to think about uh, in, in the adult system, jail is where people are held when they're accused of a crime. And prison is, is where they're held if they have been sentenced. In the juvenile justice system, we have what we call juvenile detention. Oftentimes that's used in a broad sense to mean just kids being locked up, but juvenile detention has a pretty specific meaning. Like jail, it's where a child might be held. Um, someone wants to annotate the content. I don't know what that means. Uh, should I approve or decline? Yeah. Okay, we'll decline that. Um, so I'm gonna say detention today. When I talk about that, I'm meaning pretty specifically juvenile detentions where kids are held if they're accused of a crime, but they haven't yet been been convicted uh, in court. But anyway, until the, the mid 19th century, youth and children were housed in adult jails and prisons. The first training schools or reformatories for kids uh, were created in the mid 1800s. And almost immediately, not surprisingly, they suffered from all the problems that we still see when we lock kids up today. Um, so all the things that we seem to know. Now on the community side, um, and in part response to the poor conditions of jails and prisons, uh, in, the, in 1841, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, someone named John Augustus, uh, he was a shoemaker. He became the first probation officer. He went to the court and said, take these adults that you've been putting in jail, put them under my supervision, and we'll put them to work and I'll watch them in the community. That became what ended up becoming probation around the country. In 1899, Chicago opened the first juvenile court. And this is significant because up to this point, kids were, were tried in adult courts. And so, um, uh, juvenile courts opened pretty quickly once Chicago opened the first one around the country, and they opened around the country, and they were guided by the concept of parents patriae, which uh, if anyone knows their Latin, which I do not know, that's probably the only term I know in Latin, but um, dating back to the English poor laws, this meant that the state has the responsibility and the right to intervene in the life of a child um, and assume child rearing responsibilities when, when parents supposedly could not do so. Now, while the separate juvenile court was an important and critical reform, it contributed to a different challenge. So, namely, that parents' patriae really meant that the court system was designed entirely to support what was in the best interest of kids, um, which essentially meant that they didn't have rights. Right? Each judge called his or her own shots, and kids didn't have a say in what was going on. So, guilt or innocence was sort of irrelevant because technicalities like we would expect to have in a court system shouldn't matter if what we're really focused on is what this kid needs, um, which is scary to think about. And that changed in 1967. I told you this could be a really fast history. We went like two minutes from like 1800s to 1967. Um, the Supreme Court case in Ray Galt, in this case, a young person in Arizona was sentenced to six years, six years in a youth corrections facility for making an obscene phone call. Okay. Um, now, this, of course, isn't even a crime, um, but that would only matter if he had due process rights. Galt extended 14th Amendment rights to kids, which meant they had a right to an attorney, they had a right to a fair trial, all of that. And this completely changed the juvenile justice system. Now, in 1974, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Act was passed, establishing a strong emphasis nationally on prevention and alternatives to incarceration and that juveniles could not be housed with adult inmates or be institutionalized for status offenses. And a status offense is something that a kid can do that is considered illegal, but that wouldn't be if they were an adult, like underage drinking, for example, or being truant, something like that. And this brings us to the 1990s. Um, the hopeful changes of the 19, sorry, I'm trying to advance this slide again. Uh, okay. Um, the hopeful changes of the 1960s and 70s were a thing of the past. Uh, juvenile crime had jumped considerably. We were at a war on we were at war on drugs. We were at war on crime, and I would say we were therefore on war on kids. Um, our youth detention centers and correctional facilities were getting more full. They were getting more numerous, and the complexion of the kids in there was getting increasingly darker. 
in terms of who we were locking up. The political rhetoric was getting ugly. For example, uh, I'll give this quote from our presidential candidate back in 1992. Um, I'm always uncomfortable being a predictor of doom, but I think we're in real trouble. I think our society is coming apart when it is desperately needs to be coming together. You can see it in rising crime rates. You can see it in the increasing amount of violence among our young people. That was Bill Clinton running for president in 1992. And then, um, the nail in the coffin for young people, as you saw on the last slide, was, was the super predator. Um, the introduction of the super predator myth um, in 1995 by Princeton professor John Duolio wrote of a coming wave of juvenile super predators, right? As he quoted, sort of radically impulsive, brutally remorseless elementary school youngsters who pack guns instead of lunches and have absolutely no respect for human lives. He predicted that the number of youth in custody would increase threefold in the coming years. Others piled on predicting a bloodbath when these kids grow up. Um, the stuff was, was obviously steeped in racial tones. And that was really all practitioners and politicians needed to hear. Um, in the words of one of my former bosses who was a youth advocate in the 1990s, uh, and you'll have to excuse my language, but we got our asses handed to us every day, was what he said. Every state in the country passed laws that made it easier to transfer youth to the adult system. States built bigger and harder correction facilities for youth. Boot camps became the norm. Scared straight became a popular program in schools before and especially following the Columbine shooting in uh, Colorado, a school shooting. Police became an active presence in schools across the country. And almost immediately after that, um, in spite of that, the doom that was said to have happened, uh, juvenile crime dropped off a cliff, right? Um, in every part of the country, we've seen an over 20 year decline year after year in the number of young people arrested. Uh, if I had the time to get into the weeds of this, you'd see that these numbers are down for everything um, from shoplifting and drug possession to burglary, robbery, and homicide. And it's not just these stats. If you were to look at numbers from uh, victimization surveys of kids themselves, they would tell you that they feel safer over time than they did back in this time. So this is a very real thing experience. It's not just a function of arrest. Yes, question. So I mean, it, it sort of follows that same trend that like, and the question, sorry, the question, because I'm sure you can't hear at home, but is that when did people feel safer? And the, uh, what I was saying is that uh, what you could see in the victimization surveys that they did was like the number or the percentage of kids who felt unsafe at school and in their communities started to drop basically along the same lines as as these data. Um, so, yeah, so I think that that's an important thing though to think about when we're looking at this now. Um, now, if you look at the this chart here, what you'll see is that eventually the decline in crime was accompanied by a steep decline in incarceration. Remember that during this time, the adult prison population was growing. So this is really good news, right? Well, well, kind of. I mean, during this time, there were tremendous achievements in our field. Right? Major juvenile justice reform efforts, including the one that led by my organization called the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, had spread around the country. A growing field of evidence-based programs, the funding and dissemination of adolescent brain research that not only influenced juvenile justice systems, but helped form uh, helped inform Supreme Court decisions that banned the use of the juvenile death penalty and mandatory juvenile life without parole. These were all great, great accomplishments. Um, however, right, this is going to be a slide where you're going to look at it and go, this isn't saying anything. And it's like, right, it isn't saying anything. Nothing changed. So because incarceration largely followed the trends in crime, over the past two decades, the confinement rate is a little bit misleading. So from a perspective where I started, where I said, we're gonna talk about the, not what kids are doing, right? But how adults are reacting to what kids are doing, right? Um, if our target is that, the picture is murky, murkier. Because when we look at this on a national level, the likelihood that a young person who's been arrested will be confined is basically flat, right? So I just wanna be really clear on this point. Incarceration for kids is way, 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 way down, but so are arrests. So the likelihood that someone arrested will be locked up is pretty much unchanged during this time. And, and, I, and I want to point that out because it's happening 
in a time, in a, in a couple decades, where what we know right, about adolescent development, trauma, evidence-based programs, um, proven alternatives, all that stuff, we're, we're getting all this knowledge and our reaction to juvenile crime is actually not really changing all that much. The juvenile justice system remains punitive at its heart. And that's because of the adults, not because of the kids. We remain an outlier in the Western world when it comes to the confinement of our children. We're doing better, but we still use confinement as a default whenever a young person's behavior bothers us enough, irrespective of whether that behavior scares us. So I just want to point that out. Okay. And the incarceration picture looks even more concerning when we throw race into the mix. Um, on the plus side, the drop in confinement over this time, and this I'm showing you here 2005 to 2019, um, uh, has been large uh, and it's been proportionate pretty much. Um, however, this chart also demonstrates how hollow any conversation about juvenile justice or any kind of justice, frankly, is if it is not rooted in a discussion of race. We're completely missing the point if we're not talking about race when we talk about this. Um, the system we operate for youth of color, especially black youth, is, is quite simply a completely different system than the one we have for white kids. Um, and I want this chart in particular, because like your eyes are gonna go to the big drops for everything, but I just wanna point something out, sort of circle it for a second for you if you look at this, okay? So there's been, in this chart, you see this more than 50% drop in this chart in the incarceration rate of black youth. You see how it goes from 51 down to 21, okay? So what's important, like that's great. That's a really important achievement. So during this time of this huge reduction, right? The rate for black youth then in 2019, the incarceration rate um, is 21 per 10,000 youth under 18 in the country. That rate then, when we compare that to white youth in 2005, not in 2019, okay? So you look at white youth, it's gone from 14 to five, but think about white youth in 2005, it was 14. So black, the black incarceration rate 15 years later is 50% higher than what it was for white youth back in 2005. That's what we're dealing with. So I just want to be really clear and just like we can never bury this as much as some people want to bury it in talking about youth justice. Um, and all that matters because when kids get locked up, and this is why I'm dwelling a little bit on this, um, bad things happen. We released a report in 2015 about maltreatment in U.S. correctional facilities for kids. Just since 2000, there's evidence of systemic maltreatment of kids in youth correction facilities in over half of the states around the country. National surveys of youth um, show one in eight kids who are locked up report being the victim of sexual abuse while they're locked up. All right, truly horrific numbers. And if, if that wasn't bad enough, um, we can have a whole laundry list of reasons why locking kids up are bad. Right? It's expensive and it doesn't work. Um, it increases recidivism. The very thing we're talking about, wanting to protect public safety, locking a kid up is more likely to have them be arrested than if you release them to the community. Um, we can do better. Like that's the biggest thing. There's so many things we know how to do better. And then of course, not only increases the likelihood of recidivism, it reduces the likelihood that they're gonna finish school and work. Um, some of the stats on detention are just alarming. Even a couple of days in detention has a huge impact on whether kids will ever graduate from high school. So that's a really big deal. Um, so I'm gonna, and all of that, just to be clear, all that is like before we even get to the pandemic. Okay, so I'm gonna just get to there. So I'll pause for a second before I go further and see if there's any other questions from the crowd or any in the chat or anything else that came up. All right, should I keep rolling? I'll keep rolling. I got some nods. Okay. So um, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna um start with some data that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. Um it's focused on juvenile detention, but I but the reason I'm doing that on juvenile detention is that's where we have the data. I'm gonna argue to you that what we see in juvenile detention reflects more broadly what's happening in the system as a whole, that it's a window into what's happening because we can see it, but it's going to tell us a lot about what's going on more broadly around the country. So um, 
At the beginning of the pandemic, the, the whole idea of the dangers of detention took on a completely different meaning. Um, uh, there was fear. I think you got to get your head back to March of 2020 um, that being sent to detention could be a literal death sentence for kids. We didn't know a lot about COVID-19 and we certainly didn't know back then about the impact on kids versus adults versus older adults and all that stuff. None of that stuff was known. Um, for years, we had been collecting annual data from places that we worked with um, on what we were seeing in, in juvenile detention. Um, we decided when we, my, my whole team came home from our offices, we figured out we need to do something different. And we asked the question, if we just surveyed people and said, could you send us data monthly? Would they do it? And we got a whole, we actually get started getting more data monthly than we were getting on an annual basis. And we've been getting it all of this time. Um, so for nearly three years now, we've received reports every month from now, I think consecutively, we've gotten from 139 jurisdictions across 34 states. These places add up to about a total of a, a quarter of the youth population in the country. It's not a random sample. It's not the full sample, but it's a lot of places and it gives a kind of picture of what's um, going on. So what did we learn? I'm gonna fly through this, so like at any time, but I just wanna give you a sense of what's going on. So um, you, this will look very blank to you on this slide, but I'm gonna build, build off, off on this. So um, detention populations dropped rapidly in the first two months of the pandemic. Between March and May, 2020, they were down by a third in a couple of months, which is just incredible. Um, they dropped both because admissions stopped coming in and because there was this rush to release kids from detention at the start of the pandemic. Of course, that begs the question, did they need to be there in the first place if you could just so quickly release them, but we won't even get into that um, today. So then right following that, um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were killed and the justice system was facing more scrutiny than ever, especially with respect to the racial inequities that, as I said, define the system. This was something that was felt profoundly, I will just say, in juvenile justice systems around the country. Um, I wrote at the time in a, in a uh, sort of note to our network, I, I, I wrote that I watch with pride the protests across the country in American cities and imagine young people from our juvenile justice system stepping into their civic responsibility and marching with their peers. Um, I would say between COVID and the summer of protests, this was definitely a moment of wondering whether there would be more fundamental changes ahead. So I'm gonna skip ahead another year. Um, and what did we see? Uh, basically that detention population that we had seen in that first two months drop kind of just stayed flat. It went up, it went down, but it basically stayed around that same level from, the, from, from May of 2020. Um, but then we started seeing these headlines and I put, these are just all stuff that have come up in the last, these ones are pretty, pretty recent. Um, headlines that really haven't stopped since then. They've been focused on crime and lots of them, and they've been focused on youth. And that's happened nationally. And as you can see here, it's happened right here in Maryland and Washington, D.C., um, where you've got curfews, where you got focus on squeegee kids, where you got whatever, whatever the thing is, it, we're focusing on kids uh, all over again. And it has, it had us immediately alarmed. And so what have we seen in juvenile detention then in the 18 months since I was saying it was flat before? Um, what we see now is the jump in the last 18 months has been huge in the use of juvenile detention. Um, and as you can see here, the jump has been particularly large among black youth. Um, when we started the survey, as I said, racial disparities were horrible. They were at their worst level ever in the juvenile justice system. In the places giving us data, and that for those first month, um, black youth were six times more likely to be detained than white youth. Today, it's grown to eight and a half times more likely um, during this time. The biggest reason for that disparity is that once detained, black youth are held for much longer than white kids. And I just wanna be clear again, I'm not talking about sentencing, I'm talking about cases that are still, there a kid is being accused of a crime and they're awaiting in the detention center for that for that reason. Um, and all of this has led to a place where if we finally look at this, where the black population is now significantly higher in detention than it was pre pandemic, while it's still slightly lower for white and Latino youth, at least in these jurisdictions um, that we're seeing. Okay, but looking at all of this masks a whole other issue. 
um, that the trends are actually really, really different from place to place. And this, this issue of them being different from place to place is actually what got me first thinking about this idea. And one of my colleagues coining this in a sort of email to me, is it a new normal or is it the old status quo? Um, so this is, I'm going to stay here for a little bit so you can just understand this for a second. When I was describing that survey in 139 sites, we split them up. We're trying to make sense of this increase. So we just split them in thirds based on, the, on the, where the population had gone. Um, and when we did that, when we split them into thirds, what we see, interestingly, um, and thirds just based on how big or small the decrease increase has been in their population, what you see if you look all the way to the left of the slide is that their starting point, their detention rate at the beginning was exactly the same at the start of the pandemic in these groups. But what we see since then is wildly, wildly different trends. Um, and it's really remarkable when you get a chance to like sort of think about this. So a third of the sites are now detaining, uh, have a detention rate that's 56% higher than it was prior to the pandemic. And it's jumped 81% since April, 2021, which is huge, huge change. Um, a third of the sites are sort of hovering kind of flat from where they were at the beginning of the pandemic. And a third of the sites are still about a third lower in their attention population than they were before the pandemic. Um, so this is, this is telling us that it's not like there's one story going on. There's some very different things. Crime might be going up or might be going down, but the way places are responding is really different. Um, and what's scary is when you start pivoting, when you start seeing that there's uh, both a rise in admissions and a slowing down in the release rate where kids are getting out slower and slower, that ends up very quickly creating this, which is headlines about detention centers being overcrowded. Um, I don't know if any of you are math majors or any of you have had to do statistics while you're in college, but there's two things that influence the population of a jail or a detention center. How many people are coming in and how fast they leave. If both things are going in the wrong direction, if admissions are going up and release rate is slowing down, you will be overcrowded pretty quickly. And that's what's happening. And so you can see that the different names, these are, these are big places, this is Philadelphia, this is Milwaukee, this is Fort Worth, this is all these different places are all of a sudden seeing overcrowding for the first time in many, many years in their detention centers. Um, so I'm gonna pivot to what's next. But before I do that, I just wanna take any questions. We good, yeah. Is there a regional point to- Yes. So interesting, I'm glad you brought it up. So what we've seen right now um, is the place where the, the, the numbers are going up the most is the Midwest. And to a certain extent, the sort of like north northeast as a, as a place. So interestingly, so it's not the West and it's not the South. It's, it's there where we're seeing the biggest difference. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna press ahead because I do wanna get a bit into um, thinking about so what does this mean going forward? And, I, and I've talked so much about data that I figured maybe I'll talk a little bit more about story. Um, so the last few months, I've, I've visited two large counties um, around the country that are running two very, very different juvenile justice systems. Um, but in both places, I had the opportunity to tour the, the detention centers while I was there. And perhaps ironically, the detention center themselves are the only things that were similar about the two places because detention in some ways is always similar. It's just on a scale of bad to like really bad. Um, they can, it, these were clean and, but sterile, you know, they were well staffed, but kids were in school, all that stuff was going. It would not be a place that anyone that you care about in your life, you would want them to live, but all those things were going on. Now, one of the counties, the 120 bed detention center at the time of my, my visit was mostly full. And it had been over capacity, over capacity recently. Um, a county that typically had 50 or 60 kids all of a sudden had well over 100 kids in detention. Um, now, in the other one, there were 10 kids in detention, um, where there used to be well over 100, and the capacity is 110, I think, for that. And they only had 10 kids there. Six of the kids who were in detention were charged as adults. So the juvenile justice system, the ones they had discretion over, four kids were in detention. Okay, and remember, I told you over 100 in another place that was like this. Now, in both counties, there's been concerns about increases in crime. There's been concerns about guns, all of that stuff. But in the first county, what I experienced was that while the rationale for using more detention had everything to do with what the kids were doing, 
the reasons I saw all had to do with adults, right? It was inconsistent decision making by probation intake. They're the ones who get to decide what happens whether a kid first goes into detention or not. Um, it was judges not using detention alternatives that were proven and had been used for years in this jurisdiction. So once a kid came to court from detention center, they were keeping them in rather than releasing them to a proven alternative. Um, it was a lack of urgency in scheduling court hearings, right? And then it was something we see everywhere, which is, I'll, I'll, I, this, I can uh, sort of relate to this based on my college experience, right? So let's say there's a 21 day rule for writing a report for a judge. When do they start for every kid that 21 day rule? When did you start writing the report? Day before, day 20, exactly. So if there's a 21 day rule, the report gets written on day 20. Could it have been written on day five? Absolutely, gets written on day 20. Meanwhile, a kid is sitting in a detention center, not at home, not with their family, not getting regular school, especially in the pandemic when all those things were slowing down. Yes, why do they do that? That's a great question. Why do they? Why do they do it? Why do we wait till write our you know, term papers? Yeah, they should be doing their job. Yes, but that's my point. Is that I think we're not treating this. When I said at the beginning of the pandemic, all of a sudden there was this like, oh my goodness, we can't have kids locked up. What happens? What happens if their kids get sick? What happens if they die? Um, that has fizzled so quickly back to a. Eh, an extra week in detention isn't so bad. What are we what are we doing? So the, that lack of urgency is very, um, very real. But again, I want to say like detention is just a window into other issues. This was a system that was doing little to engage youth and families to understand their needs. They were diverting fewer kids at the front end of the system in spite of all the evidence that tells us the kids do better for the most part when we just keep them out of the system entirely. They weren't willing to do that, even though in the past they were doing it. After prosecuting kids in court, they were putting a higher proportion of kids on probation, and then they were ordering a higher proportion of kids into state custody or other residential facilities. When kids were put on probation, the focus was increasingly on a whole set of expectations of kids, a whole bunch of thou shall and thou shall nots, rather than focusing on goals and understanding that change takes time, something that the choice program here at UMBC, which you're so lucky to have, understands entirely that this is a process, not something that just happens overnight. And it adds up to a place where detention, um, you know, uh, is grabbing the headlines for being overcrowded, but where detention overcrowding, I would say, is really just a symptom of, of going back to the old status quo of 1990s. Now, the second county, and this is where I'm going to end in an optimistic way, I'm going to try. Um, so uh, Pierce County, Washington is home to Tacoma. It's roughly the same size as Prince George's County or Montgomery County um, here in Maryland. Um, it's a place where we've sought to learn and support um, for many years because how they have approached so many aspects of system reform is what we think are um, essential. Pierce County is one of the first places we began to work with on transforming juvenile probation. Now, up to this point, you've largely heard me talk about kids getting locked up and all the bad things that come with that. Um, but the truth is, the more common experience for young people in the juvenile justice system is probation. And for far too long, um, probation has gotten a pass. Right? It hasn't been scrutinized in the same ways as detention and incarceration. And let's face it, probation can sound pretty benign. It doesn't sound like it's a lot, but it's not. Okay? And, I, and I'm gonna try to make that case to you to understand that, that traditional probation includes putting a whole bunch of conditions on young people um, that they're expected to follow or else they face the possibility of being locked up. Um, what kind of conditions? Go to school every day, okay? Kid who hasn't been to school for two months, Go to school every day. That's the, that's the, re, the requirement of what they need to do. And if you don't, you can get locked up. Curfew, appointment with probation officers, court, counseling, drug testing. Oh, then my favorite one, obey your parents at all times, right? That's a good one, right? Um, restitution, community service. Here in Maryland and elsewhere, a common practice in probation is putting kids on an electronic monitoring device. Um, and in places, uh, many places, this can go on for years. So for many youth, probation feels like a system that's waiting for them to fail and catch them rather than actually helping them succeed, which is the entire point, supposedly, of the juvenile justice system, helping them rehabilitate and get better. Um, thankfully, here in Maryland, legislation passed this year, and if people were at the uh, 
talk a couple of weeks ago, they would have talked about it. That reduces the length of time most young people can be put on probation, and it prevents them from being locked up just for breaking probation rules. Um, nationally, about one in six kids who are locked up are locked up on any given day for breaking those rules, not for breaking the law, for breaking those rules. So that's important to understand. Um, so what would it mean to do it differently? Um, well, it would mean maximizing diversion for the first part, be shrinking probation. Making probation better means making it smaller. That's, that's the first step, keeping kids away from it, changing the nature of it so that it's relationship-based, time-limited. Um, it's focused on connecting young people to those in their community who are going to be there for them well past their time on probation. We don't want kids growing up in these systems. We want them thriving outside of them. So it, it's sort of understanding that. Um, it's obviously minimizing committing kids to this to incarceration and all that. It means leading with race, understanding that if we are going to solve the problems of juvenile justice and we try to ignore how kids are experiencing it differently based on their race, we will miss it. We will not get it right. Um, and finally, like community partnerships is a weak spot of almost every juvenile justice system, building strong relationship with community organizations, truly partnering with them. Um, so what does it look like in Pierce County? It means a whole bunch of things. Um, we like to talk about this idea of raising the floor, raising the ceiling. You'll see here the raise the ceiling. It basically means raising the floor means it's harder to get on probation, right? Like you, ought, like most kids who are on probation today need to not be on probation. They need to be diverted. Raising the ceiling means kids who are currently being sent out of home placement. Let's instead put those kids on probation show that we can keep them safely in the community. I said before about focusing on race, and I've talked a lot about focusing on data. Pathways to success, this was them looking at their data and saying the kids who we are least successful with, kids who are most likely to recidivate, come back on probation, are black boys under 16 years old. So we need to focus on them. We need to make sure that we're giving them certain opportunities that we're not even gonna make available to other people because we are failing them. Think about that for a second, that language. The, the, they're not failing. We are failing them because our job is to help them thrive. That's that might not sound revolutionary, but that is not how the, the, the system works. So these are just examples um, of all of those things. Um, a common thread in all this has been how Pierce County leaders and staff have engaged youth, family, and communities. It's a huge part of what they do. Um, and, and I'll show you here because I think they've been able to make the journey here from the traditional way that the system works, like I said before, of telling young people what to do, um, maybe just interacting with families in that way and kids, to engaging them, which is the sort of like, let's bring people together, let's get some feedback, to truly partnering with them, which is very rare to see in, in systems. And it's been a huge part of, um, of their efforts. Um, all right. I want to make sure we get to that time. So I, I had a little video, but I think we're going to run out, run a little short. So I, I'm going to instead just talk a little bit about what they've been doing. So what you see here may look like the kind of things that maybe we would just want teenagers to do um, more generally. But this is what the probation experience looks like in Pierce County, Washington. So basically what they've decided is that while kids might get certain therapies that they have, um, and as, I, as I rushed through before, but their focus is on uh, an incentive based system rather than one that's based on sanctions because they've done they've looked at the adolescent brain research, which just tells us that, like all people, but especially kids, they respond better to incentives um, than they do to sanctions or the threat of sanctions. Um, but every young person on probation, the one expectation that they'll have is that they're participating in a positive youth development program. There are 34 different programs right now that are serving kids in Pierce County that look nothing like what programs usually look like in juvenile justice system. The, the guy you see all the way on the right, that's the Alchemy Skateboarding um, Shop, right? There's a bike building program, there's boat builders, there's a hip hop camp, there's the YMCA, there's the t-shirt guys who have their own t-shirt business and teach uh, silk screening and all that stuff. The idea of this is when we talk to young people and they say, what do they want out of this experience? They want to learn something new. They want to have opportunities. They want to earn money. These uh, programs are all about exposing young people to something they might not have already seen. They get to pick 
You don't take a kid and put them in the skateboarding program. It's like they asked to go to the skateboarding program. And the cool thing about these programs is these weren't programs, right? This is just a guy with a skateboarding shop who was like, I wish someone had grabbed me and said, like, teach me this stuff when I'm younger. So they created a program out of it. So that's the kind of thing um, that's going on. Like, I just, I, I'm bringing this up because, you know, we, we have to, um, all young people in the juvenile justice system should have these opportunities and these types of connections to not just avoid the bad things, but get connected to the good things. Um, if we're going to do that, we have to change our approach. We have to make programs like UMBC's choice program um, the norm, not the add-on on top of the conditions of probation that have no evidence at all that they're helping with anything. Um, and then I think when you do that, when you do that, then you can look at things like this is something I saw while I was in Pierce County where they're holding themselves accountable, right? For what the kids are getting out of the experience of being on probation and being in these programs, whether they're benefiting, whether they're seeing brighter futures for themselves. That's the new normal that we should be aspiring to. Um, it's not to dismiss the challenges that have when kids pose some sort of public safety threat, if kids have had experience violence, but this, this goal of connecting to young people where they're saying that when, we, when they come into our system, our goal is to see them thrive. Um, it means have they made a connection to a positive adult? Because in the long run, kids are not going to be successful if that doesn't happen. Did they learn something new that they can use? Did they enjoy, did they enjoy the experience? Like being a teenager ought to come with joy. And when we put young people in the system too often, that is removed um, entirely. So I'm going to stop there. I think I already went a little too long. Apologize. I hope this was interesting. Um, if there's any questions in the rooms, any questions online, happy to um, answer. I appreciate the time and you hearing my rants about this stuff. Yes, there's a microphone in the room. So thanks for the um, and we're indebted to your financial support, but also the larger issues around the leadership um, that you have helped all of us who are doing the work understand the larger work on this. One of the things I'm really interested in is this question, and it goes a little clear for you about like why are judges doing their jobs? And I think of them as as people who are in the world and seeing all of these in Baltimore, seeing all these project Baltimore's, right? Yes, we're, we're hearing the larger messages of really the myth of the super predator 2.0 in Baltimore. It's like squeegee worker super predator. Right. Um, and I, I had never thought of that before, but that's a synonym, right? That we're using today. So what was it in Pierce County that made adults behave differently? Yeah. Like, are they telling different stories on their news? So it's interesting because there's a lot. One of the things is a long journey and I have a slide I didn't put in, but it's about like, what are all the things that you need? Um, I think there has been a, a curiosity of really wanting to understand like what is underneath the issues that they have. That's been a long running aspect of things. There has been, I say, but just leadership, right? You have leaders who care. There's been a commitment to race equity that I think has been really important because it took them to understanding that like, who were they succeeding with or not succeeding with? Um, and it's been, it's like everything else. It's a lot of ups and ups and downs of what's happening. I think the best thing that they've done, um, some of the best things have been the, le the level of, of openness to partnering with parents and others. I mean, I, it's hard to overstate just how much parents are demonized in the systems. And I, I didn't even really say enough about that, that about like when a kid does something that parents who already are feeling awful in a thousand ways about that are then are blamed and are seen as they couldn't possibly know what's best for their kid. And I went all the way back to that parents patriarchy whole idea that still just sort of lives in the system in a way. Um, and I think they've been really good at bringing in parents and being able to be real about what's going on and what they need to do. So I think that openness has been a big part of it. And the last thing is just honestly, the openness to research. Um, I didn't talk about that, but their um, idea of opportunity-based probation 
That came from looking at research that said incentives work better than sanctions. And then they brought in a professor from University of Washington to help them design, like a psychology professor, how would we like completely reverse the way we do this? So like create a probation system that's based on every week meeting with like, because probation should only be again for kids with pretty serious offenses with serious needs. Every week meeting with the kid and their family, talking about the goals for the week. And when you meet the goals, you get incentives, not when you fail to do the things or you sanction. And it's like, I know that can feel a certain way, but as like my cause, like how many of us bribe our kids with like dessert when they're little, sneakers, but trips, like that is a part of parenting that we would all do. We understand intuitively. There are many days when we just want to like yell at the kids, does it work? Did we get anything out of it? Of course not. Like it doesn't, you don't get anything from that. So um, anyway. Yeah, sure. This is not actually a question. It's more of a question. Like you said, question about the both of where you like the past, those boards were fine, right? What happened to them? When they get out. And second chance, because like you said, their psyche at that age would like, they'll feel like they're bad, they did something wrong. That system, the system back then would have molded their mind into making them like they're criminals. Right? Yes. So why aren't there second chances for those guys who have missed this? Because if it's not fair on them, they were made that way. So what happens to them? What happens when people- Like what happens to them who are already given this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the, the downside. Well, what do we know happens? There's a lot of consequences for, for what happens when people get locked up. And um, it could be, it's harder to get work, right? It can be harder to finish school. Um, I mean, schools, once, a, once someone's locked up, the schools are supposed to be welcoming kids back. There are a lot of places where the policy is once you've been in detention, you're not welcome back in the school that you were coming from before. So we have people who want to do that. So it's a huge it's a huge issue. Um, and I think even when, um, even when, when young people do well, while they're locked up, let's say like they're in a rep, it, it doesn't, it doesn't prepare for life in the, in the real world. And it, it, you know, the impact, I mean, would any of us want to be away from all the people that we care about in that kind of way? And the strain that that puts on families, the strain it puts on everybody. So, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I come from a place of under understanding, can understand why system says for certain young people, um, they can't be on the street tomorrow. Some th things, awful things happen. And I understand that. That does not explain at all what's going on with the size of the populations of children being locked up around the country. And even if there's a young person who can't be on the street tomorrow, our question should be, what does it take to get them back in the community. That's the, that is the, literally the job of the juvenile justice system. That is what they're asked to do. And I think too often, it's not what the focus is and we don't prepare young people to succeed when they leave. And that's why they're, they're there in the first place. But you shouldn't take up the offer to go work for the United choice program after. Anything else? Can you have a question in chat? Yeah. Uh, we hear a lot of the school to prison pipeline. How can schools help instead of harm these students? Oh, that's such a good question. So this is a, I think this is a huge thing to me. We did, a, I went through a whole, um, I hope this isn't going to sound, I, I won't go on a tangent. I went through a whole strategic planning process with my team at, um, in my organization. And we're trying to figure out the focus of our work. And one of the things that came out from it um, that we just decided is that we need to do more on the front end on diversion and prevention. And a lot of the ideas that came up end up focusing more and more about schools. We really hadn't done anything with schools. But we started to second guess ourselves because like, well, we don't know anything about schools. And there's a lot of a, a lot of other people who work in schools and a lot of philanthropy that's funding things in schools. And then we met with a bunch of young people who'd experienced the juvenile justice system. And we went through a similar process with them. And we went through the same kind of planning thing. And they all went to schools. Like their their comments all were about schools. It was like, 
What should schools do? Schools should be the place that connects me to things that I never knew about, exposes me to new things. It should be things that are trying to help me do the things that I need like to succeed in life. And schools should be something that is pushing me to achieve. And the experience that they had all had was just so vastly different than that. Their experience was especially beaten before and especially after you get in trouble, you're just labeled in a way that makes schools a place instead that's sort of trying to keep you away from the school rather than engage you and bring you in. So I think it's a huge, it's a huge area. There's obviously been a lot of push in schools to do more restorative justice as those of being more punitive. There are a lot of places around the country that remove school resource officers. Um, and a lot of those places have brought them back in already. And and um, and that's a huge discussion about what what that looks like, um, and can that money be better spent on resources that would actually help kids in schools? I mean, you might probably all heard the stat: there are more um, places with police in schools than there are guidance counselors around the country, which is sort of astonishing um, to think about. Um, but I think all of that is uh, you know problematic. I don't in terms of the what we do. Um, I think schools are in a really tough spot. And I think that the pandemic has exacerbated that. If you talk to any high school teacher or middle school teacher about what they're seeing after kids were not in school for a couple of years. Um, but I just, the juvenile justice system, the child welfare system, these are not places that are going to help resolve the issues that people are experiencing there. Thank you. Well, we're at time. Any last questions? Thank you all. And I can, you know, I didn't put my email on here or anything. But you can see our website. Um, thanks for, for participating. I hope you all um, got something out of it. And I think it's awesome you have this whole series. And good luck with finals and everything else that's coming up. And we'll see you. Thanks so much. Thank you.